The Roman philosopher Seneca said this, that the bravest sight in the world is to see a great man struggling against adversity. And certainly if there's an example of that, it would be in the book of Job. As we saw last week, he was considered in chapter 1 and verse 3 to be the greatest man of the East. Job was not only a great man, he was a good man. He was not only a prosperous man, but he was a truly pious man, a man who feared God. And what is behind this book of Job is really a question of whether or not a great man will continue to be a good man even when he ceases in the eyes of the world to be a great man. Will this pious man continue to be a godly pious man even though he loses all of his prosperity? I think we really cheapen the book of Job when we make it simply about the problem of evil. That is not the purpose of the book of Job. In fact, the reason that there is a problem in this book is because Job was a righteous man. If a man and a woman is not godly and not faithful, not righteous, Job has very little to say to them. This is about someone who is godly and who is suffering with all kinds of question marks. And keep in mind that as we are reading Job, we're reading chapters 1 and 2, things that he had no idea about. He had no idea about this cosmic battle, as it were, this heavenly scene where um, uh, Satan and alone the other angels present themselves before God and Satan challenges, or God actually challenges Satan to consider his servant Job. And so Job is a righteous man who's going to suffer and ask the question why. He's going to get some bad advice about that. But at the end of the day, the Lord is going to appear, and though he will not answer most of his questions, he will walk away with a deeper relationship with the Lord. So in a real sense, there is a legitimate question here raised by the book of Job, why do bad things happen to good people? Uh, I have often been very critical of that statement because oftentimes it assumes that people are innocent before God. But there is a real sense in which Job was a good man. In fact, the Bible says in Acts chapter, 12, uh, chapter 11, verse 23, that Barnabas was a good man. He was a truly good man. He was a godly man. And yet, bad things happened to him. The wages of sin has always been death, but here you have a man who is blameless. He's blameless, and yet he is suffering. And so we learn in the book of Job, um, not all the answers, but we learn true wisdom, which is all about fearing God. In chapter 1, we saw last week that this man loses all of his wealth, and he loses most sorely his ten children. He is a man who is suffering, but the suffering is not over. And in chapter 2, we're going to look tonight at the theme of when affliction boils over, because there's a lot more affliction to come into the life of Job. And the first heading we're going to look at is, again, a blameless affirmation. It says in verse 1, Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them to present himself before the Lord. Notice, by the way, there's an accountability here. There's an accountability here of all the angels, the heavenly host. There's an accountability of Satan to God. And they come to present themselves. And in fact, that word to present means to stand before in, 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 uh, under account. And so they're presenting themselves before the Lord. And the Lord says, Yahweh says to Satan, from where have you come? And it's not as though the Lord did not know that. But Satan answers Yahweh and says, from going to and fro on the earth, from walking up and down on it, same as in chapter 1. The Lord says to Satan something similar again. Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man? And by the way, he's still blameless, and he's still upright, even though he's undergone this great trial. And by the way, we have no idea the timing here. We do not know how long it has been from chapter 1 to chapter 2. I certainly don't think it was something that happened just within a matter of hours or even days. I think there was time that has elapsed here. And so he, he, God says he still is blameless. He says, 
um, he still, verse uh, 3, he still holds fast his integrity, although you incited me against him to destroy him without reason. Without reason means perhaps even in vain. It could be a play on words. In other words, Satan, your ploy to get Job to stop loving me, to get Job to stop trusting me, your ploy was completely in vain. It failed because he still holds fast his integrity. He still is clinging to his integrity, speaking of his blamelessness. He continues to love and to serve God in spite of all that he has lost. We would do well to meditate, by the way, upon something very important here. That though we credit Job as being a godly man, and he was, Job was no different than you and I. And whenever we do what is right, we give glory to God. When we endure trials, we don't take the credit for that. We endure trials because God gives us the grace to do that. In 2 Corinthians 12, Paul speaks about in his weakness, God's strength is made known. And so we look at this and say, here's a, a godly man, and we thank God for him, but we thank the God behind this man who is enabling him to persevere. And we who have the Spirit of God, we who have been saved by the Lord Jesus Christ, the only way that we can persevere is by the grace of God. When Christians undergo fiery trials, we must not allow ourselves to be pulled away from the truth of God's love for us. He still loves us. He still empowers us to trust him. To I think John Piper said something about trust the one who keeps you trusting. It's a great line. That's the purpose of, our, of these trials. Satanic purpose is for us to stop trusting and loving God. Job has passed the first test, but now the Lord has raised the challenge again and said, have you considered my servant Job? And so Satan's going to answer that with this. He's going to give him, secondly, bodily affliction, verses 4 to 10. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, skin for skin, all that a man has he will give for his life. But stretch out your hand and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, he is in your hand, only spare his life. The adversary, the accuser, the Satan, is relentless. He continues to suggest that Job is only serving God because God has cushioned his life. You might say, Satan, you're being ridiculous because look at chapter 1, all that he's been through. And Satan's response is, yeah, you've taken away his wealth and you have taken away his children. But if you touch his body, things would be different. This line, skin for skin, nobody knows exactly what the ancient saying referred to, though there are several ideas and I think a major idea is this, is that a person will gladly give up another person's skin than their own. And that's what Satan is saying. Sure, he has lost his wealth and his children have, have died, but Job is actually so self-centered, he'd be willing to give up their lives, give up their skin, except for as long as he didn't have to give up his own. It was Warren Buffett, the billionaire, who actually came up with the phrase, skin in the game, that if you're going to invest as an investor, you need to have your own money in the game, in the investment, in case if it goes bad, you lose everyone else. Well, there's a sense in which Satan invented that and said, let Job have skin in the game here. If he suffers, he will turn away from you. Someone said to me a couple of weeks ago, they were reading a book by Johnny Erickson called When God Weeps, and I've mentioned that book 
many times, and I'll continue to do so. It's a great, great book. And they said that they've observed from the book of Job and reading Johnny that there is something about bodily affliction that can be the most severe of trials. A person can lose all their wealth and their financial security, and that certainly is a terrible burden. And when you lose a loved one, that is something that in some ways stays with you the rest of your life. So this person wasn't minimizing those kind of losses. But there is something about persistent physical suffering that is relentless that you can't get a break from. That when you're suffering from these other trials, there can be those momentary distractions. But the physical, ongoing suffering just doesn't cease. When you read the book of Job, he speaks about his blackened skin. He speaks about his rotting teeth. He speaks about his halitosis, which is a Hebrew word for bad breath. He speaks about his depression. He speaks about constant diarrhea. He speaks about this scraping of his body. This man cannot get away from this physical affliction. And so Satan says, if you touch his body and he suffers, then he will curse you to his face. To your face. Well, the Lord gives him permission. And he says, he's in your hand. Only spare his life. And by the way, if... Satan was able, was allowed by God to take his life, then actually the challenge would be over, right? But there's something else behind that. Keep in mind that Satan wants the eventual destruction of every child of God. Because the longer we live on this earth, if we're trusting God, we're bringing glory to God. But I want to say something very important here. And I've seen this throughout my entire Christian life. This obsession that some Christians have with Satan. And this wrong fear of Satan, they seem to fear Satan more than fearing God. Satan does not have the power. Satan is under the restraining hand of God. He has to get permission from God. He's in your hand. Only spare his life. And so we need to remember that the Lord reigns. I have heard Christians and I have read Christians say that when they pray about serious things, they don't pray out loud lest Satan hears them. I don't want to be unkind, but that's just nonsense. I don't care what he hears. The Lord reigns. So he restrains them. And then in verses 7 and 8, we have a very pathetic scene. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and struck Job with loathsome sores. Many translations have boils. From the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. And he took a, bro a piece of broken pottery with which to scrape himself while he sat in the ashes. The ashes were the rubbish heap of the city. Every city had one. So they take all the rubbish and they would burn them. Why is Job sitting in the ashes? I would suspect that Job is sitting in the ashes because it was kind of his sorrowful way of accepting his new status. That he sees himself at this point as human trash just thrown out with the other refuse. He has suffered. His wealth, he suffered the loss of his ten children. He's suffering physically. And he assumes that he's just now on the rubbish heap of humanity. God could have stopped it. Yet in his wisdom, he permitted it. Richard Belcher said something along the lines of what God could have stopped by his power, he allowed in his wisdom. What God could have stopped by his power, he allowed in his wisdom. And we need to realize that as we are 
seeking to walk with God and inexplicable things happen to us. And suffering comes into our lives. Sure, God could have stopped that with his power, but for whatever reason, his wisdom, he's allowing that to happen. And if I can just give you a sneak preview of the final 20th sermon. Job's going to come out of this still with a greater fear of God. Verse 9, we have words of despair. Then his wife said to him, Do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. You know, I want to say something in defense of Job's wife. I think she's been given a bad rap for a long time. I think when people think of Job's wife, they think of some Disney witch. And what she says here to Job is wrong. But keep in mind, at the end of the book, Job's going to have ten more children, which I assume comes from the same wife. I just want you to consider this, that this wife stood by her husband as they buried ten children. She's not unaffected by this. She, too, has lost her financial security. And sometimes, Christians can say foolish things. Notice that Job, when he rebukes her, he doesn't call her a fool. He does say this, but he said to her, you speak as one of the foolish women would speak. He's not saying you're a foolish woman. He's saying you're speaking like a foolish woman. By the way, the word foolish, you find it in Psalm 14.1 and Psalm 53.1. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. What Job is saying to his wife is you are responding as though there is no God. Job's wife has suffered. She's lost everything. She is burdened. I think it's also to be observed that her despairing response could also be the response of someone who cannot bear to see her loved one suffer. And so she knows if he curses God, he'll die. and He'll be out of his misery. I watched my father die, and I didn't like to see a man that was one of the strongest men I knew To this day, when I think of my father, I think of my father with a bead of sweat dropping off his nose. He was one of the hardest working men I knew. And I watched him in the the hospital bed and in the hospice just waste away. And I prayed, Lord, take him. Joe's wife is despairing, no doubt, as she sees her loved one suffer. It's hard to live near someone who is suffering and to not be able to do anything to help them. Caregivers of the chronically ill face a difficult time without a sense of calling. It can seem almost too much to bear. I was visiting one of our members there today. Jill and I were visiting two of our members in a nursing home. One of them is 98 years of age, and she's very weak. And we watched one of the sisters come alongside one of the nurses and just tenderly speak to her, tenderly care for her. And I thought to myself, again, this has got to be a calling. Because to see this kind of suffering day in and day out and to have a cheerful disposition. But Job's wife, she's burdened for her husband. But she's wrong. And her counsel is wrong. And he knows that and he responds. Shall we receive good from God? And shall we not receive evil or calamity or disaster? These are words not of despair like his wife, but these are words of devotion. Remarkably, the disposition, the direction of Job's heart has not changed a bit since chapter 1. 
He will not curse God. He will not deny God. He will not depart from worshiping or serving God. Not like a lot of people who over the centuries have turned their back on the Lord Jesus Christ when the trials come. Every new convert I've ever dealt with, I've taken them to the parable of the soils, of the soils and I pointed out to them that there's going to come a time where the cares of this world are going to come at you in tribulation and affliction. And that's going to test your profession of faith. And I've been here long enough to have seen some of you who are here go through those and keep persevering with this kind of a spirit that indeed, whether it's good or whether it's calamitous, I'm going to continue to serve God. And I've also seen, also seen others who have just completely fallen away. I remember someone a few years ago that I went to see in their home. They were visiting here and very keen and very excited about following the Lord. And a couple months later, they had a tragedy in their family. And the wife, with great bitterness, said, no, I'm done. Why would God allow that to happen? And as much as he tried to counsel, there was this pushing away of God. Well, Job manifest really the persevering spirit of the true believer. They persevere when the marriages don't improve with the profession of faith. They persevere when the finances take a knock, and they persevere when there's disappointments within church life. And they say, shall we receive good? Shall we not receive, or, and, and not receive the calamitous? In light of all the goodness of God, Job did not sin with his lips. Paul tells believers in Acts 14, 22, through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. If we are not willing to share in the fellowship of Christ's sufferings, then we have no part in the power of his resurrection. No part. And we can try to smooth that over and gloss it over all we want, but the word of God stands true. I was speaking to a pastor friend in the States the other day, and he was telling me about a pastor who's been in his church about as long as I've been here. And this pastor said to him, he said, I wonder about the wisdom of long-term pastorates. Because this guy's going through a really difficult time in his ministry. And I said, you know, as hard as it is, I think there's wisdom in that. Because if pastors don't persevere, why would you expect the congregation to persevere? Sometimes pastors cannot persevere because they're, they're chucked out. That's one thing. But when a pastor perseveres in the midst of difficulties... He's saying to the church, we can trust God in the good times as well as in the bad times. Or the bad times as well as in the good times. Well, finally, we have brotherly affection. Amid his ang agony and anguish, Job's visited by what I would call a band of brothers. Job's three friends heard of all this evil that had come upon him, and they, they come each from his own place. They come from... Uh, the area of, of Timon, they come from the area of Shuhite, has nothing to do with his size. And he comes from a name of a place, Naamathite. What's interesting, all these places are in the east, and we know for sure Timon is mentioned in Jeremiah 49.7 as renowned for wisdom. I think Job had more than three friends. But these three friends come together because these are probably considered very, very wise men. And they're going to come to be with the friend to help him. That's their initial goal in his trial. And again, I want to say this. Let's be careful of being too harsh about these men. Because there's three things here that we would all do well to imitate when those we love or suffering, first of all, they actually came. They made an appointment, it says, together to come. They made an arrangement. They came from different parts of perhaps Edom or the area of Midian, perhaps a distance from us. And by the way, again, we don't know the timing of this. It would take time for word to get to them about Job's condition. Perhaps take time for them to arrange coming. It could perhaps have been many weeks or even many months. But they make a plan to come. 
and to be with their friend. They do not keep their distance. When affliction boils over in the life of a friend or a loved one, friends and family refuse to selfishly keep their distance. And that's a temptation, isn't it? When someone is undergoing great suffering, we want to keep our distance because we're not sure what to say. Or sometimes we want to keep our distance because we feel even threatened by that. I'm no medical doctor and I don't run the government, as you all well aware. But I just think of people who suffered during COVID who could never have a visitor. And I was spoiled. I mean, the Donald Gordon allowed visitors from two until six, one visitor a day, and I picked one. And literally every day, she'd come. When people are in need, when people undergo affliction, let's not keep a safe distance. Let's come to them. There's people in our church who are suffering spiritually. And you look around, they're not here. Don't keep your distance. Be a real friend. Be a real church member. And come to them. They came. And then they comforted. They came to show sympathy and comfort him. Sympathy speaks of perhaps the emotion of grieving with, to console with. Comfort is more practical. It's sympathy in action. It's used in Genesis 5.29 when speaking about the birth of Noah, that he will bring relief, and it's the same Hebrew word. They came to bring relief to their friend. And though later on Job will say to them in chapter 16, miserable comforters are you all. Right now, they've come with the right motive. They want to practically serve him. They're seeking to do a good thing. And I need to move on, but I need to just say this. And I've learned this by my own failures. I've learned this by observing for 29 years here, 34 in the ministry. We need to be careful when someone's undergoing affliction, affliction that's boiling over. We need to be careful of this, and we mean well. But it's not always helpful to say, let me know if there's anything I can do for you. I mean, that's fine. But rather than saying that, perhaps open our eyes and say, you know what? I'm going to do something for you. I'm going to bring you a meal. You know, don't ask me if I want a meal. Just bring it to me. Not personally. <laughs> Babysitting. Giving lifts. We experienced that as a family with people just taking the initiative and saying, can we give you a lift? Well, they came and they comforted and finally... They commiserated. We read in verses 12 and 13 about how they came, and when they saw him from a distance, they didn't recognize him. So imagine them coming perhaps over the hillside, and they look up, and there's another little mound. It's the rubbish heap. And they look from a distance, they say, it kind of looks like Job. And they get closer to him, and they say, we think that's Job, but it looks like nothing like the Job we know. The guy's covered in boils. Some have even suggested that this was actually elephantitis. We can't prove that. His shape, his whole visage has changed. They don't recognize him. And then when they do see him, and they, they say, that's him, they break down, they raise their voices, they weep. They tear their robes and sprinkle dust on their heads. And I think the dust speaks of What God said to Adam, from dust you were taken to dust you will return. They're saying this man is just on the verge of death. And 
and they sat with him on the ground seven days and seven nights. And no one spoke a word to him, for they saw his suffering was very great. Give me a moment as I wrap this up, as I begin to wrap this up. Some comment, one commentary I read had a pretty good insight. He said, people commend these men because they just sat and said nothing. But actually, if you sit too long and say nothing, that can be painful. Well, I don't, I'm sure that's true, but I want to give these guys a benefit of the doubt. Because there was an ancient custom that you do this. They came and they sat with him and they said nothing. And maybe they said nothing because they really didn't know what to say. But they were with him. One of the wisest men on earth is my father-in-law. And I went with him yonks ago. I was in my early 20s to the hospital as he was dealing with a very grieving couple. Uh, they just had a terrible emergency. I remember sitting in the waiting room with the, the parents of this couple and expecting to hear some profound insight from this man of God, and he hardly said anything. But him being there, you could tell the strength that it gave to the people just being there. I mean, he did say a few words and he prayed, but there was a sense that the, that the burden had lifted just by someone who cared and came and sat. These men, as we're going to learn, their theology needed some help, and they certainly could have used a biblical counseling course. But right here, they are doing what I think compassionate people do. They're coming and they are sitting with someone who is suffering. One of the greatest experiences of love I've ever had was when my brother-in-law, Dan, sent me a message. And he said, I'm booking a ticket. I'm coming to see you when I was in hospital. And he said to me, he said, when I come... I'm bringing my books. I have study to do. We don't need to talk, but I just want to be with you. I mean, I was glad he talked. But he gets this principle. Sometimes you don't know what to say. But the, commiser the commiseration. So what do we take away from this? We should take away from this that affliction boils over in the lives of those who are godly. There's no prosperity theology here. There are some godly people, people who are following Christ, who don't have near the trials that others do, and there's no real answer to that except for the fact that we're told in 1 Peter 4, don't be surprised when the fiery trial comes. But like Job, can I suggest this? That before the adversity comes, before the afflictions boil over, we should use the opportunity to grow in our knowledge, our adoration, and trust in God. Because it is true when you're in the middle of a trial that you can turn to the Lord. But I want to tell you what, when I am feeling physically well, it's a lot easier to read my Bible than when I can barely focus. Job had a history of walking with God, loving God, and trusting God. And when the afflictions boiled over, he kept trusting God. You can't help but to think in the midst of this description, when you read through the book of Job, and you say here, the friends didn't even recognize him. I think of the words in Isaiah about Jesus Christ, that he, he was so marred he didn't even look like a human. And though Job was desolate on, a, on the, the rubbish heap, Jesus Christ was desolate on Calvary's hill. And because Jesus Christ went through that in our worst of trials, when our affliction boils over, guess what? We don't have to be desolate. We have him. And we'll celebrate that. But remember that as we go to prayer tonight. We have a Savior who cares, and a Father who hears, and a Spirit who translates our prayers 
into the will of God. Let's pray. Our Father, thank you for the example of Job. The fact is, there's only a problem of suffering for those who have faith in you. And Job did. And thank you, Lord, at this point in the story, he, he's still fearing you. And we know from the end of the book, he fears you again. Lord, help us in our afflictions to fear you, to grow in our reverence, but help us long before that to prepare ourselves for that. May we have a testimony like Job, a blameless one who turns away from evil and fears God. Amen. <laughs>